Let's make NES style chiptune music in Vital. You can download these presets, wavetables, and LFOs from my new preset pack called the 8-Bit Mega Pack. It's a preset pack dedicated to emulating the 2A03 sound chip from the classic NES. In this video, I'm going to show you how to make authentic NES style music without having to use cumbersome tracker programs. First, I'll show you how to sample a tracker and make single cycle wavetables of authentic NES sounds. After that, I'll show you how to use Vital to manipulate those sounds like an NES would. And finally, I'll show you some tricks composers use to get the most out of the NES and other retro sound chips. Right now, if you wanted to compose video game music using the same method as people from the 80s and early 90s, you'd probably use a tracker program like this. The tracker program lets you basically write code like they had to in the late 80s that would tell the sound chip how to play the music. So right now I'm using Famitracker, which is a free emulation of the NES sound chip. And you can see basically here we have five different channels to choose from. We have two pulse channels, a triangle, noise, and a sample channel. And that sample channel is rarely used because of the limits of storage on a game cartridge. So basically to use this, we have to hit record in order to enter a note. And for this demonstration, we're gonna be making a triangle wave table. So I also wanna make sure I've chosen the lowest octave I can, and then I'm going to click on triangle here, and I believe the lowest note it'll let me play is A0. So I'm going to hit N on my keyboard, and it enters that note. Now in this tracker and many other tracker programs, basically you have the data for a subdivision in one of these rows. So in this row, it's playing A0. Uh, it's using this instrument right here. Uh, I think by default, it's playing maximum amplitude, which would be F because we're using hexadecimal code. And then here's where you would put any effects. So for example, I could put vibrato, and then here are the, um, the parameters for that vibrato. So basically I could control the depth and the speed of the vibrato with these numbers here. So basically you have to deliberately enter a value for every single subdivision of every single note which gives you a lot of control, but as you can see, that would be pretty tedious. So let's just make the wavetable from this, and then let's use Vital to manipulate the sound uh, in a much easier way, but still honor the limitations of the sound chip. Um, so anyways, I'm just gonna hit play, and then I'm gonna open up Audacity and record that note. So now that I have that note, I'm gonna zoom in. And we only need one of these cycles because they're all the same. So one cool thing you can do in Audacity is grab a cycle like this. Now this isn't exact, but what you can do in Audacity is move the selection to the zero crossings by hitting Z. So after I hit Z, you can see that it fixed the selection. So now I'm gonna copy that. I'm gonna delete this and then I'm gonna paste. I'll zoom in and make sure that it's good, and voila, we have a single cycle. So now what I'm gonna do is export this to a WAV file, and then I'm gonna drag that into Vital to make the WAV table. So once you've bounced out that WAV file, in order to make a WAV table from it, all you need to do is drag it over to the WAV table editor, and where it says WAV table, I'm gonna let go. Then let's go to the WAV table editor, and now we need to tell it what the window size is. So the window size is the number of samples per cycle. So Hertz is a measure of cycles per second and sample rate is a measure of samples per second. So if we wanna figure out the number of samples per cycle, we need to divide sample rate by the frequency in Hertz. Or if you know that your waveform is in tune and you know the note name and the octave, you could put that here. Now I sampled uh, A0, but I think Vital might be off by an octave. So if I hit A1 and then hit enter here, it makes that calculation for me. So now we have a single cycle wave table made from Famitracker's triangle. 
Now the reason it has that high buzzing in the upper register is because the lowered bit depth. You can see those spikes in the upper register. So basically a lower bit depth means you have fewer amplitudes to work with. So it's going to slot in and create this staircase effect. And that's what creates that buzzing sound. Compare that to a regular triangle wave. There's nothing buzzing up there. But if I want to get that same effect, I could bit crush this and it kind of sounds like this. I can crush it all the way down to one bit. So it's basically just on or off like a pulse wave. So why don't we just bit crush a triangle wave? Well, I think that's what they did in the Magic 8-bit plugin here. I made a wavetable from that, and basically that's just a triangle wave with only 8 bits. But the problem with that is that uh, it doesn't have this skew, this kind of curviness that the FamiTracker version has. And the reason that FamiTracker version has that is because that's how the original uh, NES sound chip sounded and it gave it these even ordered harmonics you wouldn't normally find in a triangle wave. So compare that to a wavetable made from an NES sound chip. And you can see in this wavetable made from an actual sample that there are even ordered harmonics. It's not quite as skewed as the FamiTracker version, but the FamiTracker version is closer in my opinion. Awesome! Intense! The Nintendo Entertainment System. Your parents help you hook it up. The Legend of Zelda sold separately. Now having the right waveforms is just the start. Now we need to tell Vital how to operate within the limitations of the NES's sound chip. One of those limitations is that modulations can only have 16 different values. So for example, here I have this LFO controlling pitch to make vibrato. Now it pretty much sounds the same as if this was just a regular triangle, but it's gonna be a little bit more authentic since it's only using 16 different values here. The same goes for amplitude. So for amplitude, I turned level all the way down on my oscillator and assigned envelope two to control it. I turn the release time way up here so that I can control release time here. So for example, if I turn sustain all the way down, you can kind of hear the sound slotting between different amplitudes rather than gradually decreasing amplitude. That's because I remapped this modulation in the matrix here. So you can see envelope two to oscillator level, it's been remapped with this. By default, it would just be this saw wave but I made it into a 16 step ladder here. And that's gonna give you a more authentic sound that honors the limitations of the NAS's sound chip. One thing you'll wanna keep in mind if you have multiple instances of Vital playing different parts, you would wanna make sure that they're maxed out on amplitude like I have here. That way they all have the same 16 different amplitudes that they're choosing from. That's something that I really don't think anyone's gonna notice, but who knows. Another limitation of the NES sound chip was that you didn't have effects like reverb or delay. So if you wanted to make a delay, you could do that just by playing the same oscillator twice, and then the second pluck would be a lot quieter than the first one, like this. Here it is without that little echo. Here it is with it. So here I just have oscillator two playing after oscillator one. It's a little bit detuned and it's turned way down in the mix. And that's kind of a good substitute for either a delay or a reverb. It almost creates the illusion of like a slapback that you'd get from a short reverb. And it has the benefit of not using another oscillator. Even though I have two oscillators set up here, you could achieve the same effect with one oscillator in a tracking program. Another technique composers would use during this era to kind of create the illusion of space or depth is just a simple detuned oscillator. 
Now, this is pretty rare because they had only four tracks to work with. So if you had a spare pulse oscillator, you could have two pulse waves, one that's detuned and has the mix turned way down. And it sounds like this. Here it is without that second oscillator. So that second oscillator really adds a lot of depth, but you need to have that spare track. Not only was the NES sound chip limited by the number of tracks, but it was also limited because each one of those tracks could only play one note at a time, meaning they were monophonic. So composers found creative solutions around this, and I think those solutions, more than anything else, define the characteristics of chiptune music. When I think of chiptune, I immediately think of arpeggios and fast arpeggios too. This is why I included so many arpeggios in my preset pack of all sorts of varieties. Um, basically, each one of these is a different chord. And you can change the rate as well. With a high rate, it almost sounds more like a sound effect. And at a lower rate, you'll hear a little bit more of the notes and a little bit more of the chord. Now, I should mention here I have a ping pong effect on this preset. Now, I gave options in these presets for you to use these presets um, in a chiptune style that might not necessarily be authentic to the NES sound chip. For example, this ping pong thing. Uh, wouldn't be possible on the NES sound chip because everything was in mono. So if you wanted it to be authentic, like in this preset, you could just turn that effect off. So it's up to you how you want to use these presets. If you want to be authentic to the limitations of the hardware, or if you just want to compose something in the spirit of that hardware. In an arpeggio, you're rapidly modulating pitch, but we don't have to just rapidly modulate pitch we could rapidly modulate whatever we have access to. Now, in the NES sound chip, we had access to duty cycle modulations, uh, and we could go from square wave to quarter pulse to eighth pulse. So here's an example of modulating between those really quickly. So this can kind of create almost a timbre on its own with really fast modulations between two different timbres. Now I can increase the rate of this. And I can change which uh, pair of shapes I'm going between with this macro here. So you can apply these concepts to any modulation that the NES sound chip had access to. Yes! Awesome! You have exciting adventures helping Scrooge McDuck escape danger and become the richest duck in the world. Cool. Totally hot. Way radical, man. Excellent. Another way composers would get around the limitation of only having four tracks was having a track double duty. For example, in this composition, I have the triangle wave playing both the bass part and the tom part. So the bass part sounds like this. And then the tom part sounds like this. So what I did was I bounced out the track that had the bass part, then I used a separate track for the tom part, and then I just combined those tracks into one. So what I did was I just copy and pasted those tom hits over the bass part. So you can see that here, here, and here. So as a result, that bass part, or that triangle part, I should say, sounds like this. And so that kind of sounds like two instruments, even though it's one. It's sort of the same principle as side chaining a bass and a kick. So now in context, that sounds like this. Lastly, I want to talk about the unique white noise that was generated by the NES's sound chip. It doesn't sound like traditional white noise because it was made by randomly modulating a pulse wave. 
that kind of gives it almost a tonal sound. So if I transpose the noise around the keyboard, you'll hear a difference. So this is really useful for creating percussive loops. So what I did here was create a drum sequence based on the drums from Cold Sweat by James Brown. Clyde Stubblefield's playing the drums on that track, and basically I just made an 8-bit version of it. So in order to do that, I set the grid to 15 here, so that I'm using 16 different values. And then I just gave different amplitudes and shapes to every note of the pattern here. Then I'm using LFO2 to control the pitch. So basically, uh, up here you might have like a kick drum and then snare and then hi-hat. I think it might be in reverse actually, but basically I'm just modulating the pitch to get different timbres that kind of sound like different drums. Like high noise will sound like a hi-hat, whereas low noise might sound like a kick. I'm also using the triangle wave for a kick, uh, but if you had a bass playing, that might be a little bit difficult to navigate. So it still works without the triangle wave. And uh, I set some of these up so you could use the mod wheel to kind of alternate between two different patterns. It looks like these are virtually the same on this preset, but they're different on some. Um, I also set it up to swing, and this is something that you could do on the NES sound chip. Um, and it's something that you'll hear, for example, on the Super Mario Brothers theme that everyone knows. It swings, and that's part of why it's so popular is because it grooves, it's not locked to the grid. Because you could set the delay for different notes, and you could set them differently for every single note. So I captured some of that spirit here by using LFO3 to modulate the phase of these LFOs here. And basically what it's doing is it's swinging the second note here, third note's normal, and then it's swinging the fourth note here, not quite as hard as the second note. So you really have modular control over how it's swinging, because most of the time it's not going to be completely even all the time. And then I'm controlling that swing amount here. So check it out with swing and without swing. To me, it sounds a lot more natural, a lot more loose, a lot more grooving when it has a little bit of swing. It's not always the case for every groove, but for this one, I think it helps. Now, another really cool thing I did was with Macro 2, was I created like this ghost macro. So check this out. So basically what that's doing is changing the shape of these LFOs. So from like this to here or here. So low values on that ghost are like this, high values on that ghost are like this. Basically in order to do that from here, I'm holding shift. Um, but anyways, I think this is a really cool way of adding some variety to the groove. Maybe when it gets a little bit more heated, you turn this up. Um, but just be aware that it's going to affect the RMS, it's going to affect the average volume, so as a result, it's going to affect the perceived volume. So if you turn this up, you might have to turn the drums down and vice versa. Now another thing I did was I created a range macro here. And that's affecting the range of LFOs 2 and, and 5 here. Those are pretty much the same in this preset, but in other presets they're different. But basically you can affect how much pitch modulation is happening for the white noise here. So I could narrow this down and then I could increase this and get something more like a topper for my groove.
So anyways, that's how you can make authentic NES style chiptune music without having to use a tracker. Trackers are still great. They force you to compose using the same method that people used back in the day, and there's something to be said about changing your process to match the style. Trackers demand such a high level of specificity for how every subdivision of every note will sound. This resulted in some rather lazy compositions, but some beautifully intricate ones as well. If you're aware of the hardware's limitations and you have access to the original sounds, Vital is a great way to make authentic chiptune music. If you liked the presets you heard in this video, check out my 8-bit mega pack. It includes presets, wavetables, 16-step LFOs to help your presets sound authentic, as well as several meticulously crafted drum sequences. A link for that's in the video description. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for watching. The Nintendo Entertainment System. Now you're playing with power.